Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. We should do it over so I could really have an expensive dress. But <laughs> What'd you pay for that dress? $99. $99 for your wedding dress. And I had to put it in layaway. What was it that I was doing that made you say, that's the one? You were trying your best to prove to me you did not need me or anyone else. You were fine all by yourself. Oh, is that how I'm I sound? I'm not ever going to change. Yeah, I'm not ever going to change a number. I've always thought that you could change the world. God, I'm glad we're getting this on tape. <laughs> I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. But we're not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. (laughs) Hey, hey, it's Donna from Daily Dose of Donna. Every weekday afternoon on the Daily Dose of Donna podcast, I cover all of the reality TV and celeb gossip and breaking news. I'm a former TV casting director. My husband works in reality TV, and I live for the housewives, the sister wives, the southern charmers, and the summer housers. And let's be honest, all of the drama. I'll give you a day's worth of celebrity and reality news weekday afternoons in just under an hour. New episodes of Daily Dose of Donna post weekday afternoons and are now available in video on Spotify. Subscribe to Daily Dose of Donna. That's D-A-N-A on your podcast app. Okay, well, this is probably my number one favorite fill in the blanks. I don't know if it will be the easiest or the hardest I've ever done, but my guest is someone I've met before. I always say if I've met my guest before, and I've met this guest before because she's my wife, Robin. So why am I choosing to do her now? Do her? That doesn't sound right, does it? Uh, why am I? To me. <laughs> why am I choosing to interview her now? Is because tomorrow is our forty-third wedding anniversary. Yay. So I thought this would be a good time because I've been meaning to have you as oh. a guest. But I thought Tuesday, when I drop these, falls the day before our forty-third anniversary. What do you think about that? Well, can I say first, I'm shocked. I really. I'm so thrilled to be here and for such a beautiful, beautiful reason. But I have to say that so many people have asked me, are you ever going to be a guest? Will you ever be a guest? And I always say, no, no, I'm not ever going to be a guest. And here I am. Why do you think you wouldn't be a guest? (laughs) Because you know too much on me? (laughs) I don't know. I I still got the edit button. I could cut (laughs) you right out. Well, honestly, I say, oh, no, he only has brilliant people who have something to offer. And I really, I've said that, but I don't know. I just thought, oh, not me. And who knows what we're going to say when we're together <laughs> with yeah, mics. But exactly I'm right. so thrilled. No one else could do this right here today to celebrate something like this with you. So I am thrilled to be here and very excited. I'm a little nervous, though. You have three different Yep. iPads and computers One, two, three. with their backs to me. Yeah, you don't know anything that's on them. And I have no idea about anything that's going to happen today. This is a surprise for me. He only asked me two days ago to do this. Well, you said I only have brilliant people on here. And one of the myths <laughs> I want to break, you know, you've been to every show, right? You've yes. been to every yes. Dr. Phil. And before we came out here to LA, you never went to work with me. Never. You didn't go to the courtroom with nope. me. You didn't go to the office with me. I'd leave and see you when I got that's home, right. which worked for us, right? Yes, yes. Because we were was raising children at the time, and that's what you wanted to do. Yes. Do you remember how it came about that you started coming to the shows? 
Yes, I do. And we had moved out here. Jordan was the only one at home still. Jay was off at law school. Well, I have to think about that. Maybe he was still in college, but Jordan was here summertime and you started taping the shows. And so, of course, we all wanted to come, but I thought I've got to come and support you. So I came to that very first taping. Right. And one of the myths I want to blow up is people say, has Robin been to every show? Yes, she has. And I think you would get tired of looking and listening to me. But Mm -hmm. I want people to know that you do a whole lot more than just sitting in the audience because Robin is my feminine side. You know, a lot of our guests are women. A lot of our viewers are women. And Robin keeps me in my lane on the feminine sensitivity side because really, from a male perspective, it's hard sometimes to appreciate everything from a female point of view if you don't have somebody you trust. I prepare these shows really in depth. And Robin is right by my side when I prepare them. And she reads those books like I do. And she'll say, now, listen, you don't want to go here. You don't want to be saying that. You need to consider this point of view. So she's really helpful in putting the shows together. And as the years have unfolded, you have emerged as, number one, our point person in our philanthropic things yes. because you've created When Georgia Smiled, which is our premier philanthropic endeavor. And you have also emerged as one of the leading ambassadors in the fight against domestic violence and victims of sexual abuse, men, women, and children. And the work you do in that has been game-changing. It's been recognized on Capitol Hill. You do a whole lot more than just sit in the audience. And sometimes that's all people see, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. Yes, and thank you for saying that. But I have to go back to that very first day of being in the audience because just as today, like I said earlier, this was a surprise two days ago when you asked me to be here. So now I'm just so proud and so excited. But just as that first day that you started taping, I thought, of course I'm going to be there. I have to support you. I've always supported you because I'm being honest here today. I've always thought you were brilliant. I've always thought that you could change the world. God, I'm glad we're getting this on tape. (laughs) But I have to be serious right now. I've just always been in awe of your brilliance. And when you were starting this show, this was a huge change in our lives and our family and just everything about our entire life. And so, yes, I had to be here on that first day. I had to support you and our life change. And so I sat there that first day, just again, in awe, tears in the brim of my eyes, just thinking, oh my gosh, this is happening. And I will tell you and all of your listeners, every day for 17 years, and now you're starting your 18th season, I still sit on the edge of my chair and I never take my eyes off of you because I listen to you as if it is the first time I've ever heard you speak, as if I don't know what you're going to say. But honestly, most of the time I finish your sentences, but I can't take my eyes off of you. I can't stop listening. I don't know if that day is ever going to come, but I don't think it will. Well, a lot of times you don't know what I'm going to (laughs) say. That's true. That's for sure. But coming up in the first cycle, we're going to hit 3,000 shows. Wow. You've been there for every one of them. Yeah. What did you think was going to happen when we came out here? (sighs) Did you think we would be here 18 years later? Actually, yes. As the number one show in television? What did you think was going to happen? I didn't think that, but I'm not surprised at it. I didn't think that. But Did you think we'd do this for a while or no. forever? Or what did you think? I really thought we'd be here forever. I thought this was a positive change in our life. I've always trusted you. I've always known that whatever you set out to do, it would be a success. And listen, we started out with nothing. So I've always known that whatever we did together, whatever you started, whatever path we took, we would feel like successes. I knew we would be happy and we would stick with it. So I never thought that we would not be here for the rest of our lives. 
you know, you thought this was it. Because we've now lived here longer than we've lived anywhere. I know. I know. So this is home. Yes. By 50%, we've lived here longer even than Dallas. Yes. And you know, I've always told you that growing up, one goal in my life was to never have regret, to do everything with the purpose of not having regret. So I don't know if maybe that helped that we're going to do this and we're going to be successful. And I've never doubted you that you're going to make it successful. And I guess that is because I've always felt safe and I've always known that you would take care of me and our children. We walked away from a really successful life, right? That's right. That's right. Seriously, we had everything lined up. Mm-hmm. We had a beautiful home on a golf course in Dallas. The office was less than a mile away. Yeah. The sports club where we worked out and had friends and everything was halfway in between. I, I mean, we had an orbit. It was perfect. It was perfect in so many ways. We had arguably the number one trial science firm in the world. Business couldn't have been better. I and mean, we were turning business down. We mm-hmm. couldn't do everything. Mm-hmm. We were very happy where we were. So it was not an insignificant decision to walk away from that. Our boys were thriving. They were in school. They had friends, girlfriends. They were members of teams. But the underlying feeling I had was, let's do it. Let's go for it. You know, I love change. I love change. But I never had a doubt. I never had a fear in my gut that we shouldn't do it. Our number one concern, of course, was Jordan. He was at home and he was only 15. He was ensconced in this life that he loved, his school, his friends, his grandmother was there. He loved his coaches at the school. Life was good for him. And so he was our number one concern. But he didn't have that. We always had a rule. If it affected everybody in the family, the rule was... It takes four yeses and one no. That's right. It takes four yeses to make the change and one no to not make the change. It affected everybody. Everybody had to be on board. I remember when I came home, I'd been doing Oprah for four years at the time. I said, Oprah and I have been talking and think it's time to do my own show. And I got a sneaking suspicion this is going to be a full-time gig. So... We're not going to do it from here, so it's going to be New York, Chicago, or L.A., and we've kind of decided it's going to be L.A. for a lot of production reasons. So what's everybody think? Well, you were getting boxes before the end of the (laughs) sentence. I mean, you were like, hell, hell, sign me up. Jay was good for it. We wondered what Jordan was going to think because, you know, he was captain of the basketball team, baseball team, had his friends, loved everything. Because I remember you asked him, what about your friends? Uh And he said, if they're really good friends, they'll come and see me. Uh And I have no doubt I'll make new friends. Uh And he said, I'm sure the coaches there will be just as nice as they are here. (laughs) (laughs) I said, yeah, of course they will. It's funny how things come full circle because when we first got out here, he didn't know anybody. No. And so I remember when you went into his room and said, is there anything you've ever wanted to do that you can do alone? Yeah. <laughs> that you don't I mean, have yeah, to know anybody summer. that you can do yes. without friends. And he said, I've always wanted to learn to play the guitar. I've always wanted to play the guitar. I said, well, here's the deal. As soon as your dad gets home, he will take you to pick out a guitar. Right. That was 17 years ago, May. And last week, he opened up on tour with the Jonas Brothers Uh at the American Airlines Arena in Miami. And played in front of 20,000 people in the arena and just killed it. The first night of their tour. Yeah, it was the first night of this world tour. wow. You ask him that in his room, and here we are full circle. He's at American Airlines Arena playing in front of (sighs) all of those people in Miami and just had a great time. Meant to be. I mean, he knew what he wanted. So we've been married 43 years. (sighs) Yes. Why has it worked, in your opinion? (laughs) We get asked that a lot. Why has it worked? You know, we don't have the perfect marriage. Just put that out there right now because a lot of people ask that. No, no one has the perfect marriage, and we do not have the perfect marriage. But... Oh, no. Look at those pictures over there. Yeah. I look like a barber. 
<laughs> Yo, what was I thinking with all white on you? We should do it over so I could really have an expensive dress. But <laughs> What'd you pay for that dress? $99. $99 for your wedding dress. And I had to put it in layaway. <laughs> <laughs> you did put it in layaway, didn't you? I did. How much did you pay a week? Five dollars. Everybody listening probably don't know what layaway <laughs> they is. They probably don't. Because no. we're older than almost everybody oh. we know. <sighs> yes. At layaway, you would go pick something out. They would put it back, and you would pay on it every it. week. They wouldn't let you take it home, no. but you'd pay on it every week until you paid it off, and then you could take it home, right? Right. I still have the dress. <laughs> it was a hundred bucks. Yes, and I guess an all-white tuxedo must have been cheaper than a black one. <laughs> well, hell, I rented it. I know. That's what I'm saying. It must have been cheaper to rent white than it was a black one. Yeah, went down to Mr. Tuxedo and oh. rented it for three hours. Ooh. Or we begged an ice cream man to loan it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, why has it worked? Because we did our homework. I hate to sound like I've sat in front of 3,000 shows, but... <laughs> We really did do our homework. And you know, this is just something I thought of just recently because someone was asking me so many questions about Bull. She knew it was based on your company that you created before we came out here. And uh, she said, well, tell me exactly what it was about. I said, well, courtroom sciences. It was to teach witnesses on the stand to tell the truth, to testify effectively. She went, oh, very interesting. And something just kind of came to me because she started asking about our marriage. This was not an interview. I said, you know what? Something just came to me, I said to her. I think those first three years we were dating, I was actually learning, teaching myself to be his wife effectively. <laughs> yeah. Because those three years we spent learning about each other, asking the right questions. And you opened up to me. You became vulnerable to me. I saw the man I fell in love with. And I will say to all the listeners, and I've said it before, I do believe in love at first sight because I do believe, I do know, I fell in love with you that very first night. Even though you were really kind of grouchy and <laughs> you were really kind of, not warm and fuzzy, but... I was sick. You had been sick, true, but I fell in love with you that first night. So we did spend three years getting to know each other, and, and you did become vulnerable, and you did really tell me the things that bothered you and the things that didn't bother you, and I'll never, ever, to this day, forget them. And so because of those conversations that we had, I entered the marriage knowing what buttons to push if I really wanted to upset you. I've never pushed those buttons because you were vulnerable. You told me what well, buttons to push. Well, now I'm curious. What was one of the buttons oh. that you don't push? I'm writing this <laughs> down. There was a certain person you wanted me to never compare you to. That's true. And I've never done that. That's true. So there were buttons that because in those vulnerable moments, you told me things and I have made a choice never to do those because I know in my heart I could do that and I could upset you. Why would I do that? And you did tell me those things that touches your heart or makes you happy or what you need to know I love about you. Truly a list. And I choose to do those things. Well, one of the questions, because I was asking Carla, Carla <laughs> Pennington is the executive producer of Dr. Phil and, well, really everything. She is truly the brains. <laughs> no. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> dear, dear friend of Robin's yes. as well. So I was asking her, what do you think we should talk about? <laughs> and one of the questions she wanted us to talk about is, what was I doing and what were you doing when we fell in love? What was it that I did? What was it that I was doing? that made you say, that's the one? You were trying your best to prove to me you did not need me or anyone else. You were fine all by yourself. And I just thought, no, no, you need me so much in your life. You need me. You just don't know it, but I'm going to prove it to you. What do you mean I was trying to? You just weren't real warm and fuzzy. <laughs> and you were like, I'm on a mission. I have a goal in life and it doesn't include anyone. Well. 
So that was your thinking? Yep. I thought, he's trying so hard to convince me he's fine all by himself. He doesn't need to be married. He doesn't need children. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I was okay with not having children. I said that. I don't need children. I'm like, right. And if we ever have them, don't expect me to take them anywhere with me. (laughs) I won't babysit. Oh, is that how I sound? I'm never going to change. Yeah, I'm not ever going to change a diaper. I'm not ever going to drive anywhere with them. Look at him. I think this has gone on off. So thank you for joining us this week on Fill in the Blanks. Are we still on? Hey, he's like putty in their hands. He's like, now, Mom, be nice. They're good boys. Uh, that's, that's always what I get. If I say, hey, uh, hon, could you ask Jay or Jordan to not like burp in their grandmother's <laughs> ear? Oh, they're good boys. <laughs> they are good boys. They sure are. They're perfect. Yeah. I, yeah. You're speechless, aren't you? <laughs> ask me some more questions. Well, I'm going to answer the question, too. I thought it was your spirit. I thought you were really kind of spunky, smart. Yeah. (laughs) Which I found very entertaining, actually. I like that. Because I know we broke up at one point. Yes, we did. (laughs) Actually, you broke up, kicked me to the curb. So I would go talk to some other girl, but then I'd get rid of her and go home and call you and talk to you for four or five hours. Yes. And I thought, you know, what am I doing? Yes. If you only had any idea that when you were out talking to that other girl, well, I was talking to your mom, and she was helping me set up little tricks. Yeah, I actually do know that now. Okay. (laughs) Well, good for you. So we've been married 43 years. We've been together for, what, 47? 46, 46 uh, almost 47, yes. That's more than two-thirds of our lives. I know. We've been married for 15,695 days. See, that's what I love about you. (laughs) I would never, ever even think. To count it up in days. I love it about you. I take a cerebral approach to things. I know. So we've been together longer than almost everybody in this room is alive. I know. <laughs> I'm going to cry. No. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask, when did you graduate from like high school? And it's like, <laughs> after we've been married 20 years, I they know. graduated from high school. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. Do you think there were highs, lows? I mean, obviously, when our children were born. Oh, yes. Those would be highs, right? Yes, yes, yes. Jay was born in 79, Mm -hmm. September 12th, 1979. Yes. What do you remember about that? Oh, well, everything, of course, but I can remember being at your mother's home. I can remember the day of baking like six pumpkin pies (laughs) and this huge meal, of course. And of course, I knew what that meant, but still didn't believe it. I remember he came a week early. He came on my father's birthday. Uh, We were at your mother's home delivering pumpkin pies and my water broke. It was just surreal, everything, and raced home. And this was probably 9 p.m., raced home to get my suitcase. Everyone is supposed to pack. And nowadays, I don't think they do that. But we get to the hospital and maybe it was 10 p.m. And my father's birthday was the next day after midnight night. I was so stupid, but I asked the nurse, is there any way we can hold this off until midnight? And she went, what? And I said, yes, yes, can we hold it off? It's my father's birthday. My water broke. And she went, no, nah, no, you're not going to have this baby in two hours. And I had him 14 hours later. Yeah. And Jay was, what, a week old when we had to take him in for surgery? He was three weeks old, but he, weeks? it was a week old when he started all the symptoms yeah. of pyloric stenosis, the issue there, but he was projectile vomiting every time I would feed him and just shoot across the room. And I thought, something's wrong. And I was just a nervous wreck. And I took him to the doctor. Well, one morning I woke up and he didn't wake up all that long because he was so weak. All of the food, every time we'd feed him, it would shoot out and then his stomach grew shut. And so I ran down the hall and there he was. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you had already gone to work. And I called your sister and raced him into the doctor. And he said, call the dad and have him meet us at the hospital. I was like, oh. And so you did. And they realized what was wrong. And I'll never forget. I could cry now, but they put the little IV in his little tiny hand. And he had sobbed so much. He was just heaving. And you said, I'll carry him into 
the operating room and I just watched the two of you go down the hall and you were so big and that little tiny head was just right at your shoulder and he was still heaving and all I could see was that little tiny, oh. Oh, wow. What is that? Speak of the little tiny head. Oh! Look who's hi. calling in. Hi, kiddos. Oh, hi, Erica. Oh. Hi, Papa and Grandma. Happy, Happy anniversary. Oh, look at you three. Oh, Grandma was just about to cry thinking of your daddy being bored. London, how are you doing with those braces? Good. Avery, how's the bunny? Good. <laughs> Well, are you guys going to come spend the night soon? Because you got to check on your hamsters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Oh, look at Kitty. Hi, Bazan. So cute. Have you gotten your new kitty yet? Uh, not yet. That's it. Oh, that's so sweet. I will say something about this family. We love animals. We love animals. They, we would have a lot more of them if I allowed it. We'd have every <laughs> kind you could imagine. The last one they wanted lately is ducks in their backyard. Oh, now that would be really cute. Really cute. I vote ducks. <laughs> so, London, when you come over, are you going to go play golf with Pops again? Yeah. We had fun, didn't we? Yeah. You're a golfer. Yeah, he is a golfer. I'll tell you what. And while y'all do that, Avery, will bake a cake again. What'd you bake with Grandma? Um, a chocolate cake. Yeah, a three-tiered cake. Yeah, she picked out the three sizes. It had lights on it and all kinds of stuff. Wow. And London, did Pop show you how to do that straight arm when you do your golf swing? I was very impressed. He was impressive, and he did a happy Gilmore for his dad. We got back and ran about 20 yards. Oh. To the tee and hit that the ball. So cute. So Jay's with Jordan, right? Jay's with Jordan. We're missing him, but oh. at least he's with Jordan on his amazing tour right now. Yeah. Just for a couple days. I love that he surprised him. He surprised. Yeah. He said that he walked was in great. and found him in the gym that morning. And he posted like a sunset in the evening, blew a red eye in the morning. Jordan was still sleeping, so it like worked perfect. He was like, oh, Jay, Jay's at home at 11. Oh, I love it. Those are brothers. They're thicker than thieves for sure. Well, guys, thank you for calling in, surprising us. Uh -huh. I, I was so surprised. Avery, London, we love you. We'll see you later. Love you, Erica. Love, love you, you, Erica. Bye, babies. Oh, aren't they precious? They are precious. We were talking about when Jay had to have surgery. And I remember because I was on staff at the hospital, so they let me carry him into the operating room. Yes. It wasn't horrible surgery, but it's never risk-free to put a baby under general anesthesia no. at three weeks old. So that was a scary time. It was so scary. And I just dreaded every time I had to feed him because I was like, who wants to feed the baby? <laughs> yeah, because when we say projectile vomiting, he was projectile vomiting. It went across the room. You never knew how much he kept in and it just progressively got worse. And after two weeks of it, we had to rush him in there and... <sighs> But he grew up healthy and strong, yep. that's for sure. So he took the red eye and flew into Miami yes. to be there for Jordan when he kicked off tour. And I said to you, I am so shocked that Jay has not gone in to be there for yeah. Jordan on this first performance. Because they're seven years apart, but they are thick as the... Yeah, so I mean, Jay thinks that we had Jordan just for him. Yeah. Like the minute Jordan was born, Jay is just, okay, I'll take over. He did too. And he did. Yeah. Who do you think was easiest, Jay or Jordan? Oh, it's hard to say because Jay helped me raise Jordan, but I think Jay, he has been a little man his entire life. It was like he was born a man. He's had the need to run things like take care of me when you're gone. He would be six years old and you'd be working late in a conference or you would be out of town. And he truly felt the need to step in and take over. If we would go out to dinner, he was in charge of everything. And he's just always been like that. He likes to run things and he's so sweet and kind-hearted. And I don't know, he's just always been just easy. Which one of you thinks most like you? Jordan. 
no, I don't know. Jordan is so much like you in so many ways. So I'm going to have to switch and say Jay. But I don't know, because I can remember when Jay was six years old and he informed me he needed an office set up in his bedroom. He needed a suit and a briefcase because he was going to be just like his daddy from that day forward. (laughs) So there's just so much of both of them that really is you, but then they have a lot of traits of their personality that would be me. (laughs) Yes, they do. Yeah, we always do shows about in-laws. What kind of in-laws do you think we are? That we are? Yeah. I think that we're very sweet, supportive in-laws. Very sweet and supportive. We adore Erica, and we support her 100% creating her family, her life with Jay and her children. And I think that's what she deserves, and I think that's what they deserve. I always have. We never go over there. We're not the type of in-laws that just show up. And I've always been that way, even when they were without children or when the boys lived on their own. I don't believe in just showing up at their home. I don't believe in going over there. I don't even believe in inviting myself. I think that's their home. That's their world. And they deserve privacy. And so I think we're very polite, sweet, kind, and supportive in-laws. I think we definitely respect boundaries a Mm -hmm. lot. And fortunately, we get invited a lot. Yes. Get the kids a lot at our house. And also, I mean, that's great. So I think we're very blessed in that Mm -hmm. regard. Mm -hmm. Uh Hi, Mom. Oh, you're so precious. We just visited with Erica and the babies. Oh, now here you are. Oh, yeah? How you doing, boy? (laughs) I'm good. You're so sweet. You guys having fun? Yes. We are. So where are you? I am in Miami. Having so much fun. Jordan's uh, officially on the road again. Oh, did you have a ball? Are you so proud of your brother? Oh, my God. You have no idea. It was amazing. It was like dropping him off for college all over again. It was crazy. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. I was just telling uh, everyone that you were like uh, waiting for us to have Jordan because you wanted to take over. And you did. You've been like his father, best big brother, but we had him just He's for you. amazing. Standing there watching him on stage was one thing. Then turning around and watching all those people watch him on stage was something completely different. And I don't think there's anything in the world that can equal or give you the same thrill, you know, landing an airplane, no, graduating from some university, no. I mean, the thrill and the energy that you must get from having those people screaming and dancing, they all put their lights up in the air when he asked them to. I don't think anything could rival what he experienced on that stage. And will now for a hundred more times at least. Uh, yeah, when he did his new single and you turned around and scanned the arena and there were lights on, phones all the way up into the top rafters, I, I just couldn't believe it. No, I couldn't either. Aww. And neither could he. He said that it took everything he had to not stop singing and go, wow, uh, and then start singing again. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I love that you were there. What do you think about the fact that your parents have been married 43 years now? It's a long time to be married to you, Dad. <laughs> That wasn't what I was pulling for here. Oh, oh, I mean, yeah, no, it's not even a surprise. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Because your mom is like a champion. (laughs) That's right, exactly. I'm a guest today on his podcast, so I'm very proud. I know, it's a very distinguished list of people. I know. 43 years is a long time, but you got to admit, it's been a pretty good ride for you as a kid. Uh, Yeah, no, I have zero complaints. (laughs) Good answer. Except for that time when I was... 14 years now. Oh, what happened? <laughs> the mic just went dead. <laughs> you had to shave when you went to school. And he know. would go to school and not shave. And then they'd call and say, you have to come get him. <laughs> he didn't shave for school. He's had a beard yeah, since like, he was 10. He'd call me on the way to the gym. Mom, they're making me shave again. I'm like, okay, guys, let me problem solve this for you. If your solution to me not shaving is I can't go to class, then we're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'd say, Jay, why are you complaining? You're out of class. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no oh. problemo. I missed every fourth day of school because they sent me to the gym to shave. <laughs> so you got to admit, this has been a good run. And I think we're pretty good grandparents, you have to admit. Pretty good babysitters. I, uh, uh, yeah, I agree. They uh, They love nothing more than coming over there. Yeah, we just talked to them. 
Avery in London just called in with Erica, and we talked about playing golf and baking cakes and having a good time. Oh, it has been a uh, a family oriented summer. I spent four hours floating in the ocean a couple of days ago, teaching them all to wakeboard, and they've baked dozens of cakes. And I got to say, I'm going to save that picture of you in London playing golf forever because that form was perfect. I might add. <laughs> yeah, he really nailed it. Yeah, he really did. And uh, he ratted me out about the 57. Said we did a burnout with a fishtail. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's i can't great. believe he told that that's great you'll have to ask jordan he he bought a new guitar this week and it's a a 57 whatever i don't know anything about guitars but it's fun that you've got the 57 car and you've got the 57 guitar oh that's oh, great that's so cute yeah. well i think it's super that you went down there to be with your brother yeah i uh wanted to give him his space and let him do his thing but at the same time i'm like do i secretly buy a ticket on StubHub and sneak in. What do I do? Because I definitely didn't want to miss it. Yeah, he wanted you to be there for sure. I thought we definitely should stay away. You don't want your mom and dad there. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're rock star with your folks. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to do? I'm going to head home. Yeah. Well, thanks for calling right, in. Guys. I love you, yeah, baby. Yeah, I'm excited to do so. Love you too, mom. Congratulations on 43 years. Thank you. All right. We love you, boy. Love you, too. All right. See you later. Bye, guys. Bye. Travel safe. So cute. You know, we've been together so long that through our marriage, we've lost all four of our parents. Yes. We lost your mother first. Mm -hmm. Then who was next? Was it your dad or my dad? It was my dad. Was it your dad yes, next? Yes, it was my dad. And then my dad. Yes. And then my mother. Oh, she was such a sweet sweet woman. You know, when I lost my mother so suddenly and you called your mother, she loved me so much and told her what was happening and where we were, that we were at the hospital. And she rushed there to see me and she walked in. And the moment she saw me in such distress and so upset, she had a heart attack. We had to check her into the hospital. Yeah. Thankfully, and God bless, she survived, but she was in there for a week because she the stress of seeing me so upset. Yeah, because that was a shock. It was. We lost your mother instantaneously without any warning whatsoever. I was on the phone, and she passed, and I thought we'd just been disconnected. I have to tell you, that was definitely a hard time for me mm. with you, because in the time we'd been—how long had we been married at that oh, point? At that point, we had been married maybe nine years. Because I think that was the first thing that I hadn't been able to fix. Mm -mm. You tried. We got to the hospital, and we were in the emergency room, and I was on staff at that hospital as well. So I was in the trauma room with her, and when they called it, we had you in the doctor's lounge with family down there. And when I had to walk from that trauma room down to the doctor's lounge to tell you I couldn't fix this one, she didn't make it, that's the longest walk I've ever taken. Yeah, I can't imagine because she was so young and you knew how much I loved her. Yeah, that was tough. It's tough. It was tough. Because she was so vibrant and alive. But, you know, when you go through things like that, I think it welds the relationship together in a way that you just don't have if you don't go through those things. It's not that it's good to go through them, but it has a profound effect. Yes, yes. It was shocking. It was the first time I'd really experienced death of someone I loved, you know, distant relatives maybe, but... It was the first time that I actually had to experience the finality of death, and the holidays were right after that, and uh, it was so tough. I sat there and wrote those thank you notes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not going to bring that up, but, <laughs> no, you bring <laughs> but that's it up. how it's we got right. That was a pivotal moment <laughs> in our relationship, but we've grown through 
and learn through a lot of things. Yeah, what she's talking about is she had gotten really, really depressed, obviously, when she lost her mother and was just really kind of down for the count. And what really got her up out of bed was she just felt the absolute need to write notes to all of the wonderful people that had been so nice and supportive. So she got out of bed and she went into the dining room table and sat there and wrote out handwritten personal notes to every single one of them. For like three days. Yeah, for three days. There was a bundle of them and she finally finished and I think felt better oh, yes. for it. And I was leaving to go to the office and she gave them to me to mail and I play tennis every day of my life and they wound up in my tennis bag, which I didn't get in that day because weather turned bad and it stayed bad for like ever. I mean, really, it just turned bad. It rained for like two weeks, some horrible amount of time. And then it finally broke, and she went to look in my tennis bag to make sure I had everything I needed, and there were those thank you notes that I had every intention, but I didn't get in the mail. I let her down. I didn't send those notes, and I felt like that big. And when I saw you with that look on your face that you felt that big, I went, it's okay. Did I not? I like, no, I No, you did, went, which made me feel even worse that you were so big about it. <laughs> no, I said, oh, why did I say that? I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. You said, I will personally drive to everyone's home and hand deliver them and tell them it's my fault. I went, no, no, no. Then I started feeling horrible. Like, no, 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 no. Just put them in the mail today. You know, get them tomorrow. I did so, call a bunch of them. Boy, that was a learning lesson for me I did in so call many ways. a bunch of them. I, uh, and yes, said, I even... Listen, because you had seen somebody at the store and they didn't mention the note. I, I, it just didn't matter at that point. I just thought, I thought they do. It was more of something I guess I needed to grieve, but it was a pivotal moment for me then, too. Yeah, me too. It's more important that you know that it's okay than they know. Because enough time had passed, so yeah, oh, I, I felt horrible. I felt like the biggest <laughs> in the entire state of Texas. And I hated that. I just felt terrible. Still feel terrible. I still feel terrible. <laughs> about it. I feel more terrible. <laughs> okay, you win. <laughs> good, good, good. I love to win. <laughs> you definitely win. You know, when I thought about that again is when my dad died, and he and my mother had been married 53, 54 years. Yes. And the hardest thing in the world was to tell my mother, because my dad had gone to teach Sunday school and died at the front of his Sunday school class. Yeah. And you're the one that told my mother. Mm -hmm. Because I was racing over there, and I was following the ambulance to the hospital and about halfway there, they turned their lights off mm -hmm. and stopped driving fast. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, not too hard to interpret what this means, but you're the one that called her and told her. I was over there. I had gone over to oh, her home. Oh, you were there? And you said, don't let her come yet. Let's see what happens and stuff. So I said, don't, let's just stay here and wait. And then you asked me to tell her. I was like, okay. It was, it was tough, but. Yeah. I think I was you know, supposed to ask be the one. How we've been married for 43 years and gotten along and all that. It's because we've been in the trenches together. We've been in the foxhole together. Yes. We've dealt with those things that are the things that truly matter and dug out from those things. And I think that's the glue, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's the highs and the lows, and those are the things that are really there. I mean, Jay, when he was sick, and, you know, the most scared I've ever been in the 43 years that we've been married, do you know when it is? No. Tell me. You know me. I don't get scared. I don't get anxious. I get on task. Yes. 
I've crashed airplanes, and if you ever find me dead in a field in an airplane, don't think I died scared because I didn't. I died busy. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way I react. But the most scared I've ever been was over Thanksgiving when Jordan was in junior high that they call now middle Mm. school. We took him in because he had something wrong with his leg. Mm. You could just barely touch it. And it was some kind of really bizarre, rare, one in 10 million tumor Mm -hmm. in his shin. Mm -hmm. It was either benign Mm -hmm. and they would pop it out and fill it in. Or if it wasn't, you're in a world of trouble. Mm -hmm. The 24 hours it took to get that answer Mm. was the most scared I've ever been in Uh my entire life. Yes, I agree. That's really helped me to understand people when they describe fear and anxiety and paralysis and stuff, because there was nothing I could do. I was helpless. There was no hill I could climb. There was no Mm -hmm. wall I could run through. There was no Mm -hmm. effort I could make. There's nothing I could do but pray. Yes, that's exactly right. It was so scary just putting him in the hospital and putting him in surgery and having them take it out. Then having to find out what it was. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it turned out that it was okay. But that was the longest 24 hours of my life. Yes, I agree. I never told him what the gravity of it was because he was just a child. Mm -hmm. He'd been playing football in school. Yeah. And came home and told us about how much it hurt. Yeah. (sighs) That was a hard time. When they left, did you have empty nest syndrome? Yes and no. I had empty nest syndrome before they left. And it was harder with Jay because I guess of the unknown, I don't know. I just know that leading up to it, I got really sad. I sat and reflected on his life and thought about the fact that he would soon be moving out of our home and going away somewhere else. And I couldn't walk into the room and check on him, ask him if he was hungry, just mother him. So, oh, I was very sad and reflective all the time. I just walked myself through the day without him in the home, and that was very sad. And taking him down there and being busy and setting him up in his home and seeing how excited he was helped so much. And I know we dropped him off in Austin, and we were maybe 15 miles out of town, and I had to let it go and just cried and cried. But at the same time, I didn't want Jordan upset. He was in the car. And honestly, at that point, I didn't cry as much and I wasn't sad because I saw this great step in his life and how he was excited for it. So it was really the saddest before he left. But then, no, I had that one little crying spell, but then, no, not after that. And then when Jordan left, I didn't. I had this pride that we had prepared them so well for it. I wouldn't for a minute stop them from that next step in life. So I didn't have that, no. I had a completely different reaction. You remember? Because I knew what they were getting ready to do. Mm -hmm. Mm Because we were dropping them off at college, Jay at University of Texas, and then Jordan at SMU. And I thought, man, are they getting ready to have a good time? I know. know. And you said, (laughs) oh, don't be upset. Jay's going to have the time of his life. And I said, that's fine, but... What if he's hungry? And what if his clothes need ironing? Or, you know, what if he doesn't have any food in his kitchen? How's that going to go? Yeah. And you just looked at me like, you're right. Yeah. Right. Wrinkled clothes. You're worried about that? Like, no, 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 no. Yeah, she's driving home saying, I didn't teach him to iron. Oh. I said, trust me, he doesn't give two about whether his clothes are ironed or not. And then one night, I walked into the library in our home, and you were at your desk. And it was like 1.30 in the morning. And I walked by and you're on the phone with him on the speakerphone because you're listening to all of his friends. They're all telling you about this experience they just gone through with this peeping Tom at the girl's sorority and they were all after him. And I was like, what? Are y'all hungry? (laughs) I just couldn't believe it. And then I had this comfort knowing 
I should not even try to wonder or even try to think about what's going on in his life right now. And this proves it. Just yeah, they were fine. They were fine. You're they laughing, fine. and they're telling the story. They're laughing, and I just thought, okay, no more worries. I was sitting there shaking my head at SMU because you're fixing Jordan's dorm room up. Yeah, she's fixing it just right and putting everything over here, and I'm thinking. Man, you are so wasting your time because we had this really nice penthouse type condo that we kept in Dallas over at the plaza, remember? Yes. We didn't hit city limits before he was out of that dorm and into that he place at the plaza. He did not go over there until I told him when he called and said he had the flu. He didn't admit going over there <laughs> until you told him to and go. And then I had to call the chef at the restaurant there and deliver food to because he was sick. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. So what do you think about living in the public eye? Because she grew up in Duncan, Oklahoma, small town. Her dad had the driving range. In Duncan, Oklahoma. He was the golf pro there. A driving range in Duncan, Oklahoma is a pasture with some golf balls at one end of it. <laughs> and I'd go pick them up. On and the they weekends. didn't have a tractor to pick them up, right? That's right. Did you put on a helmet or anything? Or did you just well, no, get it was the... before it opened on Saturday mornings. We uh, all had to go out there. Did you get a wagon or take bucket? What did you do? Buckets. We had to take buckets. And then my father would drive a go cart with a back on it and pick up the buckets that we filled. We'd just drop them and we had to carry two at a time. And then he'd give us one when we ran out. But yes, we had to walk that whole thing, picking up balls. I took my time, but I hated it. That was your job on Saturday morning? Yes. On to sa- walk yes. that pasture? Yes. He did know there were snakes out there, right? Oh, stop. Don't even go there right now. Are you serious? Do you think there were? In Oklahoma? Yes, but it was a driving range. It was a business. Oh, the snakes, no. Oh, this is the driving range. I shouldn't go yes, here. They're going to be yes, playing golf. Yes. I don't want to interrupt it. Are you kidding uh, me? Well, I know they don't think that, but I never <laughs> thought that. Thanks for well, telling me. snakes all, uh, they have a rattlesnake oh, hunt in Duncan, Oklahoma. Oh, my gosh. Well, I Every didn't year, know it. They now hunt I'm all the rattlesnakes. Do you wear gloves? Yes, I wore gloves. Boots? No, I don't think I wore boots. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, man. So the big difference between picking up golf balls in a pasture in Duncan, Oklahoma, to living in the public eye for the True. last 20 years, what do you think about that? It's different, but we don't go out much. <laughs> but, yes, we're in the public eye, and I'm fine with it. We don't go out I'm, much, but when we go out, we go no, out. Yes, we do. And we're in the public eye. Honestly. It's okay. We've adjusted. I have to give a lot of credit right now to Oprah. I honestly believe that without her, it would have started differently because she would call all the time and prepare me and tell me what to expect. And again, I welcomed this change. People love you. That's another thing when we are out in public. People love you so much. So it's not like we're confronted with negativity when someone comes up to us sounds like I have on rose-colored glasses right now because, yes, there's a lot of negativity out there when it comes to tabloids and false reports and that kind of thing. But I learned to live with that because I know in my heart what's true. And I'm proud of you and I'm proud of why we're here. It was a decision we talked about, thought about, made the decision, and I've embraced it. And I love our life here. But it is different. It is very different. Yeah. So how do you think you've changed over the last almost 50 years that we've been together? Well, I've become a stronger woman. I've become more focused on the new endeavors we've taken on. I believe I've set goals and I don't stop until I get there. And I'm proud of the roles I've taken on as a woman, a a wife and a mother and a grandmother. I'm very satisfied with how I've lived my life. You do a lot of different things. I've always thought of you living in phases like you thought you were put on this earth to be a mother. Mm -hmm. And so you wanted to focus on kids and family Mm -hmm. and put other things on hold. And then when the kids were up and gone and you knew they had traction and were successful, then you turned to other things. Mm -hmm. You know, you've written two New York Times bestsellers, number one bestsellers. You have a very successful business. You've been very active philanthropically. You've done all of these things that 
you didn't do before because you had other priorities. Mm -hmm. And when those things were done, then you said, okay, my turn. I'm going to do some things I'm passionate about. And so I've watched you be passionate and very successful as a mother and wife and then be very passionate and successful as a businesswoman, a philanthropist, and a television personality and all of those things. So I kind of think, you know, is there anything you can't do? Oh, and I have to stop and say right now that when you describe wife and mother, my focus there, it's true. I really grew up wanting to be a wife and mother. And I've said numerous times, I I do believe I was put on this earth to nurture a family. And uh, God bless you for allowing that to happen and coming into my life. Um, Also, I can not even tell you what age, how long I always knew a focus of mine was to nurture myself, take care of myself. Yes, my family and my uh, role as the matriarch of the family was always what I believed was the reason I was put on this earth. But I think back also that I never, ever felt that I wasn't as important And I'm glad for that. I'm happy about that now. I look back and realize that was the stepping stone or that was the rock that allowed me to be a success as a wife and a mother and everything I do in my life. That if I had not believed in myself, believed that I could do it, I don't think I could have done it. Well, obviously, we're financially comfortable at this point in our life, fortunately. Don't you agree that we were just as happy in a one-bedroom apartment in Denton, Texas, as we are now? Oh, yes, yes. I don't think it has anything to do with money. I think when we lived in Denton and I was riding a 10-speed bike (laughs) to school and we were living in a one-bedroom apartment with Zip... Exactly. I thought we were just as happy then as we are now. I completely agree. I was driving that 62 Comet that I paid $225 for. And I didn't know. I mean, I knew there were nicer cars. Of course, I knew there were better cars. But I wasn't sad I didn't have a better car. I didn't sit around going, this is not what I dreamed of. No, I thought I was living in a castle with you in that one-bedroom apartment. No, I never thought that we suffered, ever. Yeah, because I remember I'd come home at night, cut through that field on a 10-speed bike, and you'd be there waiting when I came through. Were there snakes in that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, if they were, they had to be fast, because I was coming through there fast. Yes, yes. And I was always sitting at the end of the complex there, the end of our row of apartments on the steps with a glass of iced tea waiting for you. Yeah, and that was a long time ago. And I still fix that glass of iced tea when you walk in the door. That's right. But we were happy then, just like we we are now. Yes, we were. I have something else here. What? To share that just came in. Hey, Mom. Sorry I'm not home. I I feel like I want to wave. I'm touring the country. But I wanted to say happy anniversary. And, uh, you know, glad it worked because... I'm here, so good job. Love you guys. He couldn't call in, but he sent in a video. Oh, Can you see it up there? I see it up there. He so looks there, like you've he's heard from tired. everybody now. Yeah, well, he's probably been up a while. You should say that voice. That was so sweet of him. Yes, that was so sweet. Good job, Jordan. You're a doll, Philip. You're just a doll. You did that. You got all that done. Well, they were like herding cats because they're all over the place. Oh, that's so sweet. But they all wanted to register in, tell you happy anniversary. But no, we had a good time then, just like we do now, I think. Yes, yes. Different phases. We've lived in different houses, different cities, yes. different challenges. But yes. we've always found a way to make it work that's and right. to laugh and have a good time every step of the way, just like we do now. That's right. And I suspect we'll continue to do so. That's because we want to, you know? We've always wanted to. It's been what we want. Do you suspect we will? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I suspect we will. Yay! (laughs) Yeah. You picked me out early on. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. First night. 
first night? Yes, first night. I took her horseback riding on our first date. No, you and, didn't. Uh, it went really well <laughs> until I— Don't be nasty. You did not. It, I did. I took her horseback riding, and it went really well until I ran out of quarters. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, where did this come from? No, but I didn't, didn't really take her horseback riding. You took me up in your airplane. I did. She'd never been in an airplane before, so ever, I took never, her flying. Ever. It was at nighttime, which was bonus. It was beautiful. I was scared. And then you got tricky and started doing all these circles. And then you started like up and then down. I was like, oh, my God. I told you before I did it. You wanted to see how tough I was. And I was pretty tough because I didn't throw up. No, you didn't throw up. But you came close. I know. <gasps> yeah. Well, there's certain things we've learned not to do, too, right? So true. You don't coach Robin. Are you about to make me mad? No, no. I'm just saying you don't coach you. We don't play tennis together. That's so true. Coaching Robin is like baptizing a cat. If I asked to be coached, you it's just okay. don't do it. It's like trying to put a cat in a bucket. You don't do it. Hey, listen, that's so true. I'm not going to argue with you. But if I ask to be coached, coach me. But if I don't ask to be coached and you step up and start coaching me, that's not going to work. When you ask, you've got to coach you just right. No, no, no. If I ask, then you can coach me. Men and women are different. Well, but you started this out by <laughs> criticizing me. me no, no, not being I'm able just, to coach. No, I'm me. just saying you just learn about each other. That's true. There, that's true. right. Mm -hmm. Let me just tell you about coaching. Don't ask Philip to coach you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so okay. Why? Well, I guess anyone else could ask you, but I'm not going to ask you to coach me because you get so critical. I told you to do it this way. Yeah, that's what I, I mean. You got to coach you the way you want to be coached, which is fine. Just nice and sweetly. You can say, sweetheart, hon, I didn't tell you to do it that way. Yeah. I said, do it this way. But men and women are just different. That's true. That's you true. Know, if men go to a party and they see somebody in the same outfit, they're like buddies for life. <laughs> women, completely different, right? <gasps> some women, some women, yes. I actually don't mind that. I think it's fun and it's kind of funny. And I go straight to that person and go, look at us. We both have great taste. Yeah, but there's differences. You're right. But we've accommodated, and right? we learn quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Married men live longer. Really? Yeah. They're just more willing to die. <laughs> they do live longer. You set me up. Okay. How else are we different? Well, you like shoes. I love shoes. I'm not going to I didn't understand it. that from the minute we got married. I mean, she likes shoes. I thought, you can go to a bowling alley and get a pair for $2. Exactly. He's going to wear bowling shoes every day. Well, I got two pair of shoes. That's, that's enough. That's I was one true. pair I'm wearing, another pair can stand by. That's not true. You have more than two pair, but I'm not going to argue well, with that. Well, you bought them. <laughs> I love shoes. Yeah, you do love shoes. Just the other day, you walked by my closet. I went, don't come in here. And you went, why? And I said, I'm just going to say it now. I'm a spoiled brat. And you went, it's all my fault and kept walking. Did you not? Yes, I did. Okay. I didn't say, yes, you are. I, I know. just said, I, it's my fault. I said, oh, well, then come back. <laughs> yeah. So you've got something new you're starting. Yes. Which is a podcast called what? I've got a secret. Here's what's really cute, I think, is you said, I think you should do a podcast. And I said, oh, okay. And you said, just decide what it is you want to talk about and then think of a name. So I could remember coming home one evening and you were sitting there, we were having dinner and you were serving something on my plate. And I said, oh, I've got a name for my podcast. And you said, what is it? And I went, no, 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 you have to be looking at me when I tell you. Because when you looked at me, I put my hands up to my mouth like I was about to shout something. And I said, I've got a secret. And you went, oh, and you loved it. And so, yes, it's called I've Got a Secret because it's going to be about everything. It's going to be about everything that any woman and man, really, would ever want to know. And I pretty much could stop right there. But it's going to be the secret to having the best sex. It's so funny because I always start off with that. I don't know why. but Oh, well, hell, let's, let's go with that. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be on the first show. 
Okay, so it's the secret to knowing when to leave a bad first date. The secret to throwing the best dinner party. The secret to finding the right doctor. The secret to. So I encourage all women for any age, at any age, to send in questions. Because I believe that a lot of women are living the life they want to live. But they always have this one nagging, gosh, I wish I knew the secret too. And then my life would be perfect. Or some women may have 10 or 15, maybe even 20. If I only had the secret to this, my life would be perfect. I have this nagging pain. And it's not bad enough to go to the doctor, but I just wish I knew the secret to whatever. And I plan to have experts, well-known people that maybe all listeners can relate to with that issue. And just every podcast will focus on one or two subjects. And we will give so many answers to the secret that everyone wants to know. I feel like over my entire life period and the, the events that have happened in my life and the research I've done because, you know, I can't research things enough. I can't find out enough information about something that interests me. So I feel like I have the secret to a lot of things that are about child raising, about marriage, about everything that interests me. And so I'm not an expert at everything. I will bring in those experts, but I'll relate all of my personal experiences as well. And this is just a general general podcast, podcast of every facet of your life that if you knew the secret to one area in your life, one or two or three, and then we'll expand on it and you'll go, wow, think of all this information I can apply to my life to live the happiest, healthiest, most fun, most interesting. I'm going to share this with my family. I'm going to share this with my friends. I had a friend just the other day asking, I need to know the secret to Breaking up with a friend who just doesn't want to have fun anymore or who has become a nuisance. You know, there's just a lot of things people want to know, and I'm going to bring them the answer. You know the old saying, it's not a secret until you tell somebody. You told me that. I, I love know, that's, it. I yeah, love so it. This, that's the thing. It's not a secret until you tell somebody, so you're that's going right. to tell secrets that's right. to people. That's right. Because, you know, I'm good at keeping someone secret if they need to tell someone, but they don't want it told to anyone. I'll keep that secret for you. But I'm not good at keeping my secrets. Like, I don't like to hold on to something that I think I could share with someone else and it might change their life. It doesn't have anything to do with Rob McGraw revelation. No, no, no. But you're going to shoot it at your headquarters. I am. I am. On Sunset. Yes, I have my office. She has a beautiful headquarters for Rob McGraw revelation.com. We Uh order things on her website, but the headquarters is on Sunset. And it's a beautiful headquarters. And you're going to shoot it right there. Yes. I've turned an area of that office into a perfect spot for... I've got a secret. It's going to be fun. All right. Now, you have to answer some questions. You gave me these questions and told me I should ask people these at the end of my podcast. Yes, fill in the blanks. So I'm going to ask you to fill in the blanks. You wrote some of these. Oh, I wrote the, Oh. Some uh, of them you wrote, some of them you didn't. Are you going to do this? Maybe. Okay. But first, before we go to those, what advice do you have for young couples or any couple, if they're struggling or if they're just starting out, To make it work, because you've made it work, and I give you full credit. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, you've made it work for 43 years. What's your advice to young couples to make it work? My advice is never stop visiting with each other. Never stop visiting and asking each other questions about each other and about them. How was your day? Who'd you spend it with? Just little questions like that. But then, if you know that it's gotten to the point where you've changed. The dynamics have changed. Have those long conversations and always begin with that chip off your shoulder. Because when you have a chip on your shoulder, if you have that little edge, you're just not going to get anywhere. Take that chip off your shoulder, soften, have that desire in your heart to really make a change. If you can't do that, then you have to wait until you do. And if you can't, then you need to have that conversation because a couple must always have a willing spirit to make each other happy. And it starts with just a one-on-one conversation 
and you have to get back there. You can't talk to someone that has a chip on their shoulder, resentment, anger, especially if it's for you. But I just think that's so important to always get back to where you were when it was just the two of you and you could be vulnerable and have that love between you that convinces each other it will always be you. It will always be you. I'm not going anywhere. It'll always be you. I would answer that question this way. We have always said, no matter what happens, whatever disagreement we may have, the relationship is not the stakes for which we play. A lot of people get in arguments and they say, well, I'll just get a divorce or what. That word has never been spoken in our home. And no matter what the debate is, we realize the relationship is not on the table. Whatever happens, when it's all over, we're going to still be together. We know that. It's never a question. It's never an issue. We don't hold it over each other's head. It's not that intimidation factor that, oh, this could blow the whole thing up. That's never an issue. That's not the stakes for which we play. And I think people need to decide either that's the deal or it's not. And if that's off the table, then everything else kind of shrinks in comparison. It's like, are you going to get a divorce over this? No. Well, then <laughs> shut up. What difference does it make? Come on. It's just another day. Mm -hmm. Figure it out. So I think people need to decide. You're either married or you're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I would answer that. Mm -hmm. What's the best anniversary present I ever got you? I know exactly what to say. And I hope I can say it without crying. On our 20th wedding anniversary, well, I'm going to tell a few details. You took me to dinner at the beautiful hotel downtown in Dallas, and you had booked a room, which I think was so romantic. It was probably the one and only time you've done that. And you had arranged your mother to babysit, and we had dinner. And then you gave me this book of poetry. Six months, you wrote 20 poems for 20 years. You had gone through all of our photos, and you picked photos that actually were from that year and some reflected the poem and it was so beautiful. And the last poem you wrote was, if life were a garden and I could walk through again, you're the flower I would pick for another 20 year spin. And you had it bound in black leather and the title was in silver leaf. It was just mm -hmm. beautiful. Yes, that was it. Well, I did It'll pick you for it. another 20 year spin because <laughs> yes. here we are at 43. 23 years later. It's beautiful. Well, I would have to say the best anniversary present that you've gotten me were the things that you've made. You made this incredible video as Shania Twain <laughs> and got all my friends uh -huh, involved and uh -huh. had them in black patent leather pants. John Perry shot the video. You were Shania Twain, and it was amazing. <laughs> and then... For the 40th anniversary, you got your wedding dress out, got the your veil. veil, and painted this amazing painting and put together a video to the yes, Ed Sheeran song. Yes, we found love. Yeah, which was really great. And then there was another one, which actually was a birthday present, where you took over the Beverly Hills Hotel and converted it. Yes. And I think that's when you played the video. That's when I played the Shania Twain video, the Shania man, Twain I feel like video. a woman with all your friends. <laughs> and at the time, I think you thought I wasn't very impressed with it, <laughs> and I was just speechless. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was amazing. What's the biggest, strangest favor you ever did for me? Me? A favor I did for you? Yeah, I know what the answer to this is. Oh, what I got in the truck. <laughs> I was cooking and I said, you'd been in the garage all day trying to find this rattle in your car. And you came in the kitchen. She said, could you do me a favor? And I went, sure. I just need you to come out here and get in the trunk of the car. You had the trunk open. You had some towels in the car. But you'd gone in the bathroom and pulled the decorative towels that no one's supposed to touch. And you laid them out in the trunk and you said, if you could just get in the trunk, I'm going to start the car and maybe you could hear the rattle. I said, sure. But then you close the trunk, you get in the car, you start it up. And I'm like, what? 
and you back out of the garage and I feel this bump. Now you've backed out of the driveway area into the alley. You drive out of the alley and drive across to this cul-de-sac from our house, right across, and you start doing circles in that cul-de-sac. I didn't know the trunk lid was going to latch. You were just supposed to hold it. I'm supposed to hold it. I'm screaming, stop the car, stop the car. It's throwing me all over the trunk. Finally, you stop the car. I hear you get out. You come around, you open the car trunk, and I'm like, bleeding. Oh, come I have chunks of hair out. I'm crying. And you look at me and you said, did you hear anything? <laughs> oh. 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 The trunk oh, of course I didn't hear anything. I'm screaming the and The trunk wasn't supposed to latch. Bleeding. The trunk wasn't supposed to latch. It hit a bump and it latched. Who cares? See, you didn't even look at me in the blood, the hair got and everything. You just said, did you hear anything? Did you hear anything? I think she's exaggerating not a little exaggerating, bit. Not exaggerating. I bit. think she's exaggerating not a, a lot. Bit. No, I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. And I said, hear anything? Did you not hear anything? Yeah. Look well, at me. They're not going to hear what you said when I opened that trunk. I can't say it because no. we'd be thrown off the air. The strangest favor I ever did for you. I don't know. I don't think I'll ever go forget that. What was the favor you did for me? I don't know. What would you think it would be? You got your vasectomy reversed. Oh. (laughs) Well, you didn't ask for that. No, I didn't, but you knew I I wanted it. it. That's the strangest favor I did. Surprise. We could put that under surprises. I got my vasectomy reversed. And now we have little Jordan. Because she wanted this one. (laughs) Jordan. If you could leave right now and go do blank, you would do it because you've always wanted to but never told anyone. Visit a woman's prison. I've told you that, though. We well, haven't told other people. No, I've never told anyone that, but I would love to go visit a woman's prison and just visit with the women. All right. I've always wished I could blank, but life just got in the way. I've always wished I could live in Paris. Really? Uh Uh-huh. If I could snap my fingers and have blank sitting in front of me, I would tell them blank. Oh, my sister, that I miss her. (laughs) You're talking about your sister, Cindy, Cindy, who you lost just recently. I've never told anyone that I blank because I know no one would believe me. That... I took gun lessons, and on my test, I scored at the level of an FBI marksman. Yep, that's true. Yeah, you don't want to come in our house at night (laughs) unannounced. The nicest thing I've ever done was blank, and this is the first time I've ever told it. Oh, no. The nicest thing I've ever done. That you've never told anybody. When I was working, and I quit my job because I was pregnant with Jay. So I was an industrial engineer technician, and I would go out onto the plant floor at CertainTeed, and I would do time studies for incentive pay on the people on the line. And they weren't supposed to talk to me. It was the day before Thanksgiving. I asked this one girl, you know, you have big plans for Thanksgiving? And she said, no. I said, why not? And she said, well, I have three little kids, and I can't afford to cook a turkey. And My husband left me, and it was just really sad. So we won't have Thanksgiving dinner. This was the week of Thanksgiving, actually, because I waited after work, and I watched to where she walked to her car, and I went to the grocery store and bought everything she would need for a Thanksgiving meal. And the next day, I went and put it in her car. Mm -hmm. I've never told anyone that. I never told her it was me. It's a good thing. (laughs) All right, I guess now I have to answer them. If I could leave right now and go do blank, I would because I've wanted to, but never really said it. I would go gliding. I fly everything, but I've never flown a glider. Yes. Well, I've flown gliders that weren't meant to be gliders because right, <laughs> the engine quit, but I really want to go gliding like in the mountains, and I've just never done it. I've always wished I could blank, but life just got in the way. Learn to dance. 
I've just never, because I just have horrible rhythm. I just wish I could learn to dance. You should take lessons. Well, now my knees are like really bad. So if I could snap my fingers and have blanks sitting in front of me, I would tell them, interestingly, it would be your sister, Cindy. Oh. If I could have her sitting in front of me, I would tell her, I'm sorry I didn't pull it off. You did everything you could. Because she deserved to still be here. Yes, she did. <gasps> you did everything you could. The nicest thing I've ever done was blank. And it's the first time I've ever told it. I give an embarrassing amount of money to animal rescue. And people say, well, what about people? Well, we do that too. But I'm really passionate about animal rescue, but I do it anonymously. I have a story too for you, but go ahead. What? When you were in your office in Wichita Falls and you parked in the back and across the alley, there was this garage apartment. And you would tell me about this little boy who lived up there with his mom and his aunt. And all he had was a ball to bounce, to play. And you would talk to him when you'd get out of the car and you asked what he wanted for Christmas. And he said, ah, we don't do Christmas. It's just my mom and my aunt and we can't afford Christmas. You said, what is Santa going to bring? And he goes, my mom said Santa might not know where our home is and whatever. And you said, I want to ask his, his aunt if it's okay if she takes them somewhere. And you cleared it with her that we go into the apartment at, upstairs and leave some things. And she said, yes. But she didn't tell him. And she took her sister and her nephew out to lunch. And during that time, we took up a little Christmas tree. We decorated it. And we put a little bicycle. That's what he wanted. And he wanted a Dallas Cowboy shirt, football, helmet, jersey. And his mom liked ham. So we took a ham. And you had me pick out some things for the mother and the aunt and then just some little toys and we just stuck up there and we did it all and then we hid in your office with the lights out and watched them go up there and see it because you could see the tree twinkling from the street he never knew it was you but then he told you the next week when you went to work he asked if it was you yeah i never told him you said no must have been santa that's really sweet that's fun yeah that was fun well, we've been talking a long time, and <laughs> I hope people have enjoyed it. I mean, we talked about things we haven't usually talked about. Anything you want to say that we haven't said? No. <laughs> I'm just happy to be married to you. I love you. Well, I love you, too. And it is not easy interviewing your wife. <laughs> it's just not easy. Were you nervous? You never know what I'm going to say. I don't. I never know what you're going to say. But that's it. Well, this is 43, so maybe I'll interview you again when we hit 50. Yes. What do you think? Let's do it. All right. It's a date. If you would like to watch the video of this entire interview, please go to Dr. Phil's YouTube channel and subscribe. It's free, and you will find this interview and a whole lot more.